Well, hello, Letourneau. I am uh, Mrs. Laura Laster. <laughs> and I'm going to talk to you about a plaque. So, quick quiz, where is this wall? I know some of you guys know where it is. It's not a class, so I'm not expecting you guys to call back at me, but a lot of you know I teach in the aviation department. And so, naturally, the answer of where the wall is is at the airport, yes, or Abbott Aviation Center, if you prefer the technical name. But what is on this wall, we're going to zoom in. Here is a plaque, and it's an award. It is an award for something really awesome. If you can read it, it says Top Female Flight Student, and a sidebar of all the certificated pilots in the U.S., only about 8.4% are women. And for all you aviation nerds, that includes student, pilots, recreational pilots, sport, private, commercial, ATP. And Letourneau Aviation is consistently way over 8.4% of its aviation students who are women. Now, that's not why I'm here to talk to you about today. Um, but that means that this plaque is pretty awesome. And we are celebrating outstanding female flight students. So the question is, why is it that every time I walk past this plaque at the airport, I don't really get very excited about it? In fact, I avoid looking at it very much. Uh, let's look at why, because that's an odd thing for me to say, right? Maybe it'll advance. There we go. There's the detailed view of this plaque. So. I graduated from Letourneau Aviation in 2004. But you see there's some names, and there's a name in 2004 that does not say Laura Laster. For everybody who can read, it says my friend's name, Stevie Peace. And so I don't, I really don't particularly care for that plaque. Because <laughs> my name's not on it, right? So. And you guys laugh, but um, yeah, it's, it's an award. There's tons of other awards you can get at Letourneau. You name it, you can get it. I mean, there's Distinguished Senior. I see those upstairs in the Allen Center. Uh, we give out an Outstanding Student Worker in the College of Aviation. I don't know what other colleges give that one out. We have the Outstanding Fill-in-the-Blank Graduate, right? They get to carry the big banner, the gonfalon, into graduation. I think there's a most promising sophomore engineering student, might be junior, I don't know. I asked my husband who's an engineer and an engineering graduate, and he was like, I don't know what, what it is, if it's sophomore or junior, but you have student athletes awards, you have dean's awards, and many of you have your eyes focused on different awards. Um, Letourneau, I know, is a traditionally student body of high achievers, and I know a lot of you were a salutatorian or a valedictorian in your high school, you were in National Honor Society, you won a bunch of scholarships. People who are smarter than me get all this data and they tell me we're a campus of high achievers. This is very impressive. But for me, what I want to talk to you about today is why I don't like the plaque, why I don't like the award on the wall, because it's an issue of pride. And what it comes down to for me is a heart issue, is a battle in my own mind versus what I know I should be, a humble person, versus what I'm default wired to, which is a person who wants to be the best, who has pride. And it, so it comes down to pride. And a few weeks ago, Dr. Mason gave a charge to all the faculty and staff and he asked us to think of one word that sums up what I want God to do in me that will help me focus and filter what I do and see this year. And I thought about that. And really, the first word that came to mind for me was humility. And we've been going through a theme of chapels about cleansing and being renewed. And I want to think about how pride interferes with this renewal. 
So we're going to go back to what did it do in the past? What did pride do in the past? Where did it come from? So a brief history of pride. What do we see happening back in Genesis? Now I know about 60 of you are in my FCAS class, and we've been going through Genesis too, so they have a preview of this. But everybody else, we haven't talked about this. So we're going to look at Genesis 3 today. And I'm just going to read starting in verse 1. Now, now the serpent is more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat from the fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw the fruit from the tree was good for food, pleasing to the eye, also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. So, summarized so far, humans have been told not to eat from one tree, the knowledge of good and evil. God said, don't do it, or you're going to die. And then the serpent comes along and tells Eve how she can become like God. And in that moment, Eve has a thought that maybe this is a way she could try to gain wisdom that she currently doesn't have. God has something that she doesn't have. So we keep reading in verse 7. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then... The man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And I think this is funny, a little bit funny. It's not funny, but it's not funny that they ate the fruit. And they're immediately ashamed of messing up. They go and they hide. They try to make coverings for themselves. The ironic part is God says, where are you? Even though God definitely knows where they are. And Adam gives the opportunity to answer and says, I heard you and I was afraid, so I hid. So God says, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? Then the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. So, obviously they ate it. They're immediately ashamed for messing up. And that the first sin that we see here is really not about eating fruit. I mean, I don't know if it's an apple or a pomegranate or whatever, and I'm sure somebody in the theology department could give me some more information about that. But we're not really talking about eating the fruit. The goal that they saw, that Eve saw, is she wanted to be like God. She had human pride at the root of where this all ended up. And then they're ashamed, again because of pride, because now God knows that they did wrong, they know that they did wrong, and they don't really want to admit to messing up. And pride goes and says, go hide from God. You don't want to admit to being wrong. Maybe he won't know about it somehow. And then, when he does know about it, they immediately play a blame game. So, we have plenty of reasons why we mess up and blame other people. My kids do it to each other. My students at 7 a.m. sometimes blame their phone for not going off with the alarm, and that's why they're late. Sometimes they own up to just being late. But more often than not, there's a blame thing of what goes on. But I want to springboard off of this into talking about some different sins. So this is the first sin, but there's tons of other sins that show up all throughout Scripture. So I want you to think about what sin you hate more than any other when you see it in somebody else. Is that laziness? Uh, is that maybe lying? Is that greed? Is that like cutting in line in front of you somewhere? Walmart? Saga? Is that substance abuse is it getting angry at people flying off the handle of vanity no i would say that it's pride 
That's a sin that you hate probably more than any other when you see it in someone else. And it's not my idea only, obviously. Um, we're going to go to C.S. Lewis. In Mere Christianity, which is an excellent book if you haven't read it, I highly recommend it. He says, there is no fault which makes a man more unpopular and no fault which we are more unconscious of in ourselves. And the more we have it, the sin of pride he's referring to here, the more we have it ourselves, the more we dislike it in others. So, does that seem exaggerated to you? Well, he has given us another idea, another really good quote of how to examine yourself for this thing this problem. Ask yourself, how much do I dislike it when other people snub me or refuse to take notice of me or shove their oar in or patronize me or show off? The point is that each person's pride is in competition with everyone else's pride. So, you know, one reason I don't like the plaque at the airport is somebody refused to take notice of me. And I didn't get any recognition on the plaque. Now, I got this funny picture off despair.com, which is a secular website, I think, but they have got this exactly right. For those of you in the third balcony who can't read it, it says, Pride, the art of calling faith in yourself self-esteem while calling it conceit when you see it in others. We're really good at that, right? We're like, man, you are good. You are all you need. You got self-esteem. You got a good, good, good version of yourself. And you see someone else with that, and you're like, well, they're conceited. I don't know what's wrong with them. But that is exactly what happens. So how does pride work? I got one more quote from Lewis, because I can't stop quoting C.S. Lewis since I read this book. And he says, pride gets no pleasure out of having something, only out of having more of it than the next man. So the symptom you see in your life is comparing yourself with others, that pleasure out of being above the rest. Like, who did I score higher than on that last test? Did I go to more floor duvos than the other people on my floor? Or for the pilots in here, I can make a better short field landing than those pilots over at XYZ school. Insert whatever rival school you want to put in there. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't compete. We're not saying we shouldn't try to do well. But when that turns into getting more pleasure out of whatever you're doing than somebody else, then we have the problem of pride. So what comes out of our heart is bearing fruit. Now this whole pride thing kind of struck me this summer as I was in a Bible study with a bunch of female aviation students, part of Women's Aviation Society, and we were going through fruit of the Spirit. And we were talking about how what comes out of your heart is fruit. That's what the fruit of the Spirit is all about. And I also got to thinking about this last week when I was hearing Dr. Liebengood talking about acts of attentiveness. And he had a triangle that he put up on the screen. And I was sitting there looking at that triangle. He had three different sides of the triangle. And these sides of the triangle were identity, a sense of identity, a sense of purpose, and a sense of belonging. And they, acts of attentiveness, point you to God. If you can do those acts of attentiveness. And belonging to God is really important. But I got to thinking, if you mess up that triangle pretty bad, it's going to look something like this. So I know it's not a triangle. I'm not math department, but obviously that's not a triangle. But uh, Dr. Liebengood said I could use this. And I reworked it, and I said, well, if all your sense of purpose is wrapped up in you, and all your identity is wrapped up in you, and all your sense of belonging is wrapped up in you, and not in God, all this is pointing into you, and we get this. It's not a triangle. I'm also, my husband's an engineer, but I'm not. But I even know that you shouldn't build a bridge out of something like this because it's just going to fall apart. We should use a triangle shape, right? Which is why Dr. Liebengood's picture was so much better than mine. But what can we do about all this? So this is a big problem. This is a big heart issue for me um, from the fruit of the Spirit, what comes out. 
What can be the antidote for pride if the root of all pride goes back to the first sin in Genesis 3? Where do we go from here? So I want to fast forward into the New Testament a bit and look at what does it say in Philippians 2 and what Paul is saying to the Philippians. The ultimate example that Paul gives of humility is Jesus, as explained by Paul. He says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset of Christ Jesus, who, being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he, Jesus, made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance of a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. So he sets up Jesus as our ultimate example of what to look for. And Paul says, have a humble attitude, value others above yourself. Jesus comes to earth to make himself nothing, humbles himself even unto death. And that death that he comes has to do that to take on our sins, including the ultimate sin of pride that we have in our own lives. So I would say, first of all, you look to Jesus as an example. Another thing that we can do as part of the antidote for all this is, is seeing other people as made in the image of God. They are like you. You're made in the image of God, and God made each person special in each person's own way. Different than you doesn't mean that you are better than these other people. Now, I really like practical things. So, I'm a pilot, so I want to talk through a few practical steps, what we can actually do um, to open us up to God's molding in our lives. And that just goes back to that word I said that I'm going to use for my word of the year, and that's humility. The first thing you have to do is admit that you have a sin of pride in your life. That is step one, and that is critical. If you don't do that, nothing else is really going to work here. If you don't think you have this sin of pride in your life, then you need to pray for God to work on you more in that area, I guess. Because the step one is admitting that you have a problem. We can't solve it if we don't admit it. But God has to change us in his power. So here's a picture of some grass at sunrise and a dawning of a new day. And God initiates the sunrise each day. We can't just initiate change in our own heart by like doing it ourselves. We have to be moldable, willing and wanting God to change us. God does the work. We have to come to our own conclusion. You have to come to your own conclusion that you struggle with pride, or I, have to, I had to come to my own conclusion that I struggle with pride. Maybe you won't be 39 years old when you figure it out. That would be good. That would be good, because that's how old I am, and I'm just now figuring this out. But the ideas that I came up with, with how to allow God to really mold in your lives, are some of these. So humility is very closely tied with gratitude. So if you're feeling proud, I suggest you stop and pray and praise God for the gift or the trait that he gave you instead. So if I'm excited because I ran a, a race and I did a good job at that, I like to run, um, instead of being like, I'm better than all these other people, instead I'm going to stop and say, thank you God for my healthy body that you've given me. Um, thank you for how you give us the ability to exercise. And I'm going to turn that back and be gratitude, have an attitude of, of gratitude toward God. Um, next is giving glory to God and growing your relationship with him. So for years, I have misread Philippians 4.13. Here is my high school yearbook. And I went to a really small school, and we could each say a bunch of stuff about us as seniors. And there I am, and it says favorite scripture, Philippians 4.13. I used to read Philippians 4.13 like this. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And kind of mumble that part of the verse. And, I mean, like if you read what I wrote under my name, it's like really sickening to me. It's like, call me for free airline tickets. I don't know. It's like, I'm going to be awesome. I'm going to go out and be an airline pilot. Um, so, there's my high school thing right there. And 
And when you misread Philippians 4.13, what it needs to be said is, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Not, I can do all things and just mumble the rest of it out. Another thing that I have found that helps me is to pray through scriptures. My mind tends to wander a lot. It goes a million miles an hour. I like to think about all kinds of different things at once, but it doesn't really help me to get focused on praying. So what I've been doing is handwriting out various prayers in Scripture and then underlining areas that stand out to me and praying through them. So I've been praying through Psalm 51 and doing it over and over. Just every, every, every time I think about this, I'm going to do it, a prayer like this. I'm going to underline it and say to my, you know, pray to myself. Um, I'm praying, as I'm praying to God, I'm saying, you know, dear God, give me an attitude of humility. Um, David in Psalm 51 is basically saying, have mercy on me. So I might underline mercy and say, dear God, make me a person of mercy. I thank you that you're showing me how, I, how you can change me. And I just kind of expand on there and use the scriptures as a tool to pray through. And praying for the renewing of your mind, being made new by God, realizing that God has to do the work in your life. And then finding an accountability partner, maybe a Bible study group or a life group, and somebody that you can talk with about your struggles, that really helps me to stay accountable as well. So my end goal is really that I would like to be able to walk past this plaque in the hallway at the airport without jealousy or sadness or disappointment. I don't know if I'm ever going to relish walking past the plaque, and I feel like if I think I've gotten there and I think I've attained humility, I have just lost it. <laughs> so I hope one day I will enjoy this wall, but more than that, I really want to celebrate the achievements of others, having a grateful attitude toward God for everything, even awards I didn't win with no hint of pride and having that attitude of humility. It is going to take a constant cycle of self-realization of pride, having that as a sin, valuing others as made in God's image, being grateful, growing your relationship with God. And so my prayer is that God would mold me into that trait of humility.